With us now, Rudy Giuliani, one of the president's attorneys, live in Washington, D.C. And Mr. Mayor, thank you for your time today. Let's That's go ahead and get, you, uh, get your initial reaction to what we have learned so far. Well, we're very, very, very happy. I mean, it's a clear victory. I think uh, any lawyer would say when you get a declination, you just won. Now, this is a little strange because uh, the special counsel has used a standard of proof that's unheard of. He says he can't be conclusively uh, sure that the president didn't uh, commit obstruction. Well, you know, that means the president has to prove his innocence, which kind of upends 2,000 years of jurisprudence. But be that as it may, that's the reason maybe why he was confused. Look at the page two of the report. You'll see two statements. He says... We can't conclude the president committed a crime, but we can't exonerate him. Well, nobody's asking him to exonerate him. And the, re the reality is that the overarching principle of, uh, of obstruction law is uh, it's very, very hard to make an obstruction case when there's no proof there's an underlying crime. So you have to assume the president's innocent, which he is. Why did Bob Mueller punt on that decision? Because I suspect he had a disagreement uh, in his staff. Uh, the, the attorney general today laid out uh, the classic view of obstruction. What I had many debates with him, what the independent uh, special counsel's office was doing was trying to extend that statute beyond its reach. Uh, and they were stuck with two things. One, no underlying crime. So it's hard to find a corrupt intent. You can do it. There are cases, but it's hard. It becomes particularly hard when there's no tangible obstruction. So you go through, you go through, you know, one point four million pages of documents, you go through all the testimony, they got everything they want. Nothing was obstructed. They can't point to a single thing that was obstructed in the investigation. So now you're talking about a purely theoretical uh, crime. And I think as a practical matter, in most United States attorney's office, they left this kind of thing out of court. Uh, because these people had a bias, strong one, and because they used a standard of proof, I mean, it's an amazing standard of proof can't conclusively determine he did not commit obstruction of justice. I don't know. But, but I've been practicing law a long time. But, I don't know how you prove a negative. Rudy, isn't that him trying to get in the mind of the president, trying to figure out intent? I mean, ultimately, that's pretty much what was decided No, here. but you do it the and, other and, way. And Bill Barr said there was no intent, and maybe Bob Mueller or others on his team argued well, otherwise. Oh, I don't think Bob Mueller, I actually don't think Bob Mueller disagrees with this decision. I think it's some of the more out-of-control members of his staff who had this very extended definition of obstruction, and they have a history of this. There are two cases in the Supreme Court that one of his prime prosecutors uh, kind of engineered. Both of them ended up with a unanimous decision, pretty close to a unanimous decision, throwing the case out for a totally uh, bogus reading of conspiracy to defraud. So they were extending a crime that doesn't apply. The attorney general is a good lawyer. He applied the classic definition of obstruction. And you can torture it all you want, but it's not there. And from now on, I think prosecutors should return to, uh, you've got to determine whether there's a case to be brought against the person. You don't look for, can I exonerate him? The minute you start trying to exonerate somebody, you can, you can investigate forever. And it's totally unfair. Do you and this president has been treated totally unfairly. And we heard that from him himself just a few moments ago speaking at the White House. Do you expect Robert Mueller to testify? I, I, I don't know. I mean, it'd be, it'd be good if he did. Um, I mean, look, uh, this all began as, was there collusion with the Russians? And now we're having an academic debate over obstruction of justice. Well, I mean, the big victory is no collusion with the Russians. I don't think uh, you could be any clearer of that. You can, re you can read that collusion 200 pages as much as you want. Believe me, I was up two nights going through it. And you're not going to find a darn thing that shows that President Trump or anybody in his, on his campaign had any kind of connection with whatever the Russians were doing. Uh, Rudy, so, um, answer this question, too, about um, th this ongoing fight that you had with the special counsel as to whether or not you would sit, submit to an interview. Well, why, why uh, would I do well, that? Would uh, I, here, let me just, I'll get the question yeah, out and I'll let you answer sure. it, okay? Uh, according to what we're learning here, Mueller's team considered Trump's written answers inadequate but decided not to fight over the <laughs> subpoena to interview him. But that was one of the big arguments you were making, that the president did not have to submit to an interview. Well, I'd be interested so, in Sol I'd, I'd be interested I, in Sol I know you're declaring victory on that. Do you think ultimately that decision to fight him on that no. legal on, on that legal front perhaps led to 
today's conclusion. No, I think uh, I'm interested in Saul's view on this, but I mean, any, anybody who practices law for, you know, two weeks is not going to want their client to testify. Now, when you represent a president, it's a different kind of client, and you've got different needs and different circumstances. I think by the time we decided we would only, only answer those limited interrogatories, we had pretty much gotten uh, public approval for the fact that the independent counsel, uh, uh, special counsel, was really trying to trap him into perjury. And then by that time, the Flynn example had come out, where they called Flynn, they lured him into thinking it wasn't going to be a big deal, he didn't need a counsel, they went into his office, they asked him a question about a meeting, and in their briefcase was a transcript of the meeting. And when he said he couldn't remember it, they never bothered to show him the transcript and say, well, I'll refresh your recollection. Well, that's a, tra that's a perjury trap. You know, fair, you can do it. But when you know that the people investigating you are using those tactics, you would lose your law license if you walk somebody in, you know, without a lot of work for some kind of questioning. Brody, these people, how, these people how much believe me, this, Bill, yep. these people acted in bad faith numerous times. They treated people horribly. What they did to Manafort should be investigated. And then somebody's got to ask the question now. This has been the third investigation of collusion, two by the Justice Department. Both conclude nothing, yep. nada, uh, no until, evidence of collusion. Why did this six, start? Yep. Who well. did it? They're, you're going to find the crimes there. You want Russian collusion? Go look at the article in the Ukrainian papers a week and a half ago about how they've opened an investigation of their own uh, officials for colluding with ago, Hillary Clinton. Up until 60 minutes ago, how much of this report had you read? I read every single page of it. Every page. So well, We started so on Tuesday Bill, night. Bill we Barr's team allowed you at the White House to see all of it. Not at the White House. We went to the Justice Department in a secure room. We couldn't take it out. We couldn't photograph it. We had to leave our phone. I mean, went into a skiff. And the four of us, myself, Jay, Jane, and, and Marty, uh, we read it, and we were going to originally divide it up, but we decided we had to all read it and then share our thoughts about it. So it took. Were you took allowed two to days. take notes? Allowed to take notes, yes, but not allowed to not allowed to take. Rudy, it what we away. know though is House Judiciary has already approved a subpoena uh, to see the full unredacted report. I mean, members of Congress, some of them, they they want to see the evidence, the underlying evidence as well. If if that were to happen, how would that? change the perception of this well, report? I can't tell you about the redacted parts. Very, very little is redacted in the obstruction set, in volume two, the obstruction section. S substantially more, as you, as you would expect, is redacted in the, in, in, in the collusion one, because that involves national security. I think the attorney general, as far as I could tell, played it really straight. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing in the obstruction report that's going to surprise you. All of it's been litigated, you know, through the papers, uh, through the Washington Post, the New York Times, Fox, CNN. We've discussed it all. You know, the, 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 you, were di you were discussing the, the Donald Jr. meeting, uh, all of these things, the Flynn, the Flynn conversation, the firing of Comey. It's, there's not a single surprise. Some things uh, probably didn't get as much emphasis, so the, they, people might be surprised. But if Such you covered as what? it carefully, if you covered it carefully, it's all there, and they just don't have a case of obstruction. And believe me, these people tried really hard to stretch obstruction beyond any fair meaning of it, and they used a standard that's absurd. The president had to prove his innocence. Uh, Rudy, just reading about the written answers to be inadequate, that's, that's the words of the special counsel. Uh, we re inform counsel of the insufficiency of those responses in several respects. On more than 30 occasions that he does not recall or remember or have an independent recollection of information called for by the questions. You have you looked at the questions? That? They're like a law school exam. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them goes on as an entire page. They, it's not, they, they didn't ask questions. They asked questions with subparts and subparts of subparts. And I was on that campaign with them. And, you know, a normal person is not going to be able to remember some of the details they wanted. They're asking questions about 2016. And in 2016, he was working 12 to 16 hours a day. And his mind wasn't on these subjects, in part because what they asking about didn't happen. And I told you, they put a burden on him of proving his innocence. And he pretty darn well did it uh, for collusion. And I think he did it for uh, obstruction. But they applied a theory then that is unknown to me as an established theory of obstruction, which is basically if somebody's thinking something, even though it doesn't result in, even though there's, a, there's an overriding 
innocent intent to clear yourself as an innocent person, they're going to select uh, their inference. And here is one of the answers, response to question one, parts A through C. I have no recollection of learning at the time that Donald Trump Jr., Paul Manafort, or Jerry Kushner was considering participating in a meeting of June of 2016, nor do I recall learning during the campaign that the June 9, 2000 meeting had taken place. That's in reference to the Trump Tower meeting there. Now, what, and what's wrong with that answer? He has no recollection of it. Uh, it he, there, that's basically the way most of our mind works. Every, every once in a while, we have something we clearly know, we clearly remember. But, you know, it, probably if he gave that answer, he would say it didn't happen. That pro probably lawyer, you know, lawyers tend to want to give you a little hedge of uh, no recollection. But the reality is we're talking about a period of time where these things were not paramount on his mind. Let me give you an example of that. Why, you know, if you go into a perjury trap with prosecutors who are in bad faith, maybe somebody might have mentioned it somewhere, someplace. Mm. They didn't, but I mean, suppose that happened. And wanna... you said no, and then th th these guys would nail you for perjury. That's what they did to Flynn. The FBI agents walked out of that interview, and it's recorded, and it's been published in the newspapers, and they were convinced that he was telling the truth, and it was a failure of recollection. But the sneaky people running it had the evidence hidden, never showed it to the general. I don't know if they're proud of themselves, you know, trapping a general who served our country for over 30 years, bankrupting him putting tremendous pressure on his family. Are they proud of themselves? They trapped him. They never would have prosecuted this guy. They created the crime. Somebody's got to do something about that and rein them in. One of these guys is a terror. Read, read, never mind. No, no, there's, is, there's, is there's a terror. One, one of these guys saying? is a terror. He shouldn't be allowed to prosecute. He did it in Arthur Anderson. He did it in Merrill Lynch, created crimes in both. He's been cited by the Justice Department twice for not turning over exculpatory material. And I know from the witnesses, he treated them horribly, horribly, like, you know, this was uh, the Grand Inquisition. But they still couldn't make a case. So that tells me there's nothing there. Okay. These people used a standard of proof that's impossible, and they acted like this was the biggest terrorism case of the century. That being and they said, couldn't Rudy, make I, I, I want to bring Brett Bayer in here, but just real quickly, based on everything that you just said, would you be comfortable then allowing, at, at the very least, some members of Congress to view the report without redactions or at least just maintain the grand jury redactions? You know, I, I, I just don't know what, what's in those redactions. I have no idea. I, 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 as the attorney general said, we didn't ask for redactions. If we did, they weren't going to give them to us. But we, we didn't see anything we had to redact. I'm very comfortable in having everything out. On the other hand, I can't, I can't you know opine about uh, investigations that are going on okay. or classified material. I would imagine the problems about uh, putting out re uh, redacted material are going to be more in volume one, meaning the collusion, than in volume two. Got it. I think. Brett? Yeah, Mayor, uh, thanks for being here. I, I want to just go through a couple things with you. The you're right. Uh, what the attorney general said at that press conference on the collusion and conspiracy uh, is in the report almost word for word that there were no Americans found uh, to work with the Russians uh, to interfere with the election. But on the obstruction issue, there are these 10 incidents, these right. 10 different things listed. One of them is called the appointment of a special counsel and efforts to remove him. Uh, it says June 17th, the president called Don McGahn at home, directed him to call the acting attorney general and say that the special counsel had conflicts of interest and must be removed. McGahn did not carry out that direction and decided he would resign rather than trigger what he called a potential Saturday night massacre. It goes on in this other place to say that that the president tried to cover up and deny evidence by then uh, saying that McGahn should not say that he, the president, uh, told him to get rid of the special counsel and, in fact, deny that he did that. McGahn told those officials that the media reports were accurate and that the president had directed McGahn to have the special counsel removed. So understanding that they're not finding the legal bar for obstruction of justice, it does this and these 10 things open the door for the House to look at uh, the political bar of impeachment uh, based on this? Well, well, let me see if I can address myself to both of those, because I know, the, I know both those situations pr uh, pr uh, pretty well. I mean, the fir in, the, in the first one, uh, first of all, there's a difference in recollection about these things. The president didn't testify about this, so I can't give you 
his version of it. So let's assume that these are true. In, in uh, both cases, here's what you're faced with. The president did not have a guilty motive. The president was and is yeah. considered under the law now because there's no finding of an underlying crime. He was an innocent man being accused of something he didn't do. And he found a lot of irregularities in the Mueller investigation. Not just the conflicts, Mueller hired, Mueller hired the chief counsel for the Clinton Foundation. I don't know, if Hillary Clinton was under investigation and somebody hired me to investigate her, I think she'd be pretty darn angry. So that was an absolutely ridiculous decision that Mueller made. Then he hired people that were highly partisan Democrats, not just prosecutors, Democrat, Republican, but people who participated in campaigns, people who were very strongly supportive of her, people that were at her party and were seen crying. So these things will affect a person, particularly a person who's an innocent person, who believes he's being framed. And he was right. He was, you're going to find out over the ensuing four or five months, they were framing him. This is a deliberate plan to plant this idea. Do you really believe this all started with that stupid little statement to Papadopoulos, who I don't even know who he was? He was down here on the campaign. Great guy. I'm not trying to demean him. But, I mean, this wasn't Bannon. Yeah, I think One that there's a lot to, to that we don't know about the early part of the investigation. I, Hopefully I, the IG I, I used to do will, this work for a living. If that's not an intel, a counterintelligence frame-up, I will eat my hat. And, I can and tell hopefully you the, the IG that are and the attorney, attorney general's group is going to look into all well, of that. Hope, but I'm I asking the specific question. The same because they'll catch The specific it. question about these 10 different times, what, how do you think, is there an open threat mm -hmm. to the president, to the administration, from okay. the House of Representatives on this issue? You've read it and you know the, what's in there. Absolutely not. And if, you, if, if anybody uh, fairly looks at it who is a good lawyer, and applies uh, the principles of obstruction of justice, doesn't make it up, then there's nothing, uh, there's nothing the president has to worry about. Now, there could be in that report, you know, the report could have been perfect, and they could have said the president failed to p pay four parking tickets, and Jerry Nadler would go after him. So, I mean, this is a political exercise for them. This isn't an exercise of, of uh, you know, fairness. I mean, they prejudged this case a year ago. They turned out to be totally wrong about it. So now they're trying to resurrect something out of it over obstruction. But, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to uh, go after a man for obstruction <laughs> when he was falsely accused. He was defending himself. His intent in each one of these situations, all ten of them, is easily explained as an intent to not get framed. So there are instances, instances in which he says about Manafort and Cohen, basically says he's very supportive of them because they're telling the truth. Well, of course he would be. Gosh almighty, you know, if I was accused of robbing a bank and I was with my friend that night, I'd be really supportive that my friend, you know, back up my story because it's true, and he doesn't, he doesn't get uh, intimidated by Mueller's out-of-control prosecutors, and they don't put him in solitary confinement the way they put Manafort, and they don't question him 11 times and try to get him to say, they tried so hard to get Manafort to say, that the president knew about that meeting on June 9. They literally conducted the kind of questioning that you conduct for a terrorism suspect. On but, him. Mayor, in this report, it says the president became aware of emails setting up that June 9th meeting between senior campaign officials and Russians who offered derogatory information on Hillary Clinton as part of Russia and its government support for Mr. Trump. On multiple occasions, quoting from the report, in late June and early July 2017, the president directed aides not to publicly disclose the emails, and then he dictated a statement about the meeting to be issued by Donald Trump Jr., wow. describing the meeting as about adoption, is what is written in the report. Well, the reality is it was about adoption. Uh, everyone, that, everyone concedes that. Uh, that meeting was a setup. I mean, the, the day before the meeting, the Russian woman, uh, Natalia, met with the person who ran Fusion GPS. Boy, that's a coincidence, right? And this guy testified under oath. They never talked about the meeting they were going to have the next day. And then she met with him the day of the meeting. And then she met with him the day after the meeting. They set up the meeting on the pretext that it's going to be about dirt on Hillary. <coughs> Nobody has any dirt on Hillary. They don't talk about dirt on Hillary. They talk about the Mag Magnitsky Act and Russian adoptions. And then they walk out, and they never really seriously call back and follow up on it.
and several of them are counterintelligence operatives. That was a pure setup, that meeting. I mean, that, the, the, the criminality in that meeting is probably going to be the people who set it up to try to frame the president and put But a, just to be clear, what we heard from the White House and the president at the time was that he didn't put out that press release and that he wasn't behind saying, don't he, no, get... No, no, no. He, 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 uh, that, was a mis that actually was a mistake of communication with one of his lawyers. The president corrected that within a week. And the reality is the special counsel did opine on that and came to the conclusion that there was no uh, criminal intent to commit obstruction of justice. Basically, they said, because it was a... Basically, this was a press statement. What they're really saying is, if you start applying obstruction of justice to press statements, you know, that are technically wrong, with no real intent to accomplish anything, we're going to have a real problem. I mean, half of Washington will be in jail. May Mayor Chris Wallace in Washington. Uh, that was actually How are very wise. That, I, I give him credit for that, although they just mentioned, take a, look, take a good look at the conclusion on that. The conclusion says that you can't charge anyone with a crime here because it clearly was a press statement and there was legitimate confusion. The special you, counsel uh, does grant that. Mayor Chris Wallace here. Uh, you Hi, have Chris. suggested that this counterintelligence investigation did not begin because of this comment from George Papadopoulos, a foreign policy advisor, although that yes, may sir. be overstating his role. That was back in June or July of 2016. What do you think was the start of the investigation? What do you think was the genesis for the start I, of the I, investigation? I, uh, so I, be, I begin, I, ha I have for about six months, you know, question whether that flimsy little allegation that the Russians had dirt on Hillary could start this gigantic investigation, could allow um, the Justice Department, the Department of Justice to put under investigation a presidential candidate of a major party, not warn him about it or tell him that maybe he's being invaded or intruded. Since the uh, electronic surveillance was obtained with an affidavit that has several serious perjurious statements, including not describing the Steele affidavit correctly, or Steele dossier correctly, those, those warrants are illegal. They were, they were obtained on, under false pretenses, with false statements. So to say that they were spying on them, I, you know, you could say it a couple of ways, uh, unauthorized or illegal uh, electronic surveillance or surveillance that could be declared to be illegal because of the, there were false statements, about four or five of them in the affidavit. So... Uh, I don't know where. But it Mayor, started. to go back to my to go back to my original question, what do you think was the genesis, and when do you think the investigation of Donald Trump started? I think it started before the first meeting with Papadopoulos. I think uh, Masood, the uh, the diplomat Malta, Malta, I think from Malta, the diplomat from Malta who has a counterintelligence background, who planted. I mean, this information didn't come from Papadopoulos. He met with a guy in Italy who turns out to be a counterintelligence uh, operative, either Maltese or Italian. They tell him, this guy tells him, oh, the Russians have uh, dirt on Hillary. And then a month later, another guy, Australian operative, uh, walks in on him in London, gets him around to that subject, and he gives the information to him. And then they record it as if it comes from Papadopoulos, but it was fed to Papadopoulos. I don't know, Chris. I used to do this. Sounds like a counterintelligence trap to me. Where does it go back before that? Wait, I have wait, some wait. Are, you, are but... you suggesting that, that the whole thing was a setup from the very start? No. By, uh, by uh, oh, intelligence oh, oh. officials to try to I frame Donald who. Trump? I don't know who. Somebody, it wasn't just an accident that uh, Masood met with him and gave him the information, and then they ran somebody into him to pick it up after. I do not have sufficient information or evidence to feel secure in telling you anything beyond that, except, in fact, all I have beyond that are a couple of hypotheses. But we'll have to see if a good investigation can ferret that out. I think it's sure worth it. I think they'll find something.